this is my where I used to live, and I show them different places. And they say, well, it's a rough neighborhood. I say, yeah, it was rough when I was growing up. Well, why don't you start talking? Mm. Okay. Okay. You want my name and all that good stuff? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my name's Todd Curry. Um, What's your middle name? Huh? Middle name. I don't need the middle name. No, what's your middle name? I don't need the middle name. Is it Todd Frederick? This is my <laughs> older sister, who always does these things. <laughs> so it's Todd Michael Curry. Yes. Uh, I grew up in the South End. And... Um, Where'd you go to school? Went to Notre Dame Catholic School, grade one through five with the nuns. I never recommend that to anybody. Nuns were tough, uh, but uh, that was those days. Um, I uh, did a lot of odd jobs, got married very young, got married at 18 years old. Uh, went through a lot of different changes when you get married that young. Uh, ended up getting my own business uh, in my 40s um, and just gave that up a couple years ago and I'm getting ready to retire. Yeah. I was not in my family, might as well go this. You know what? Anybody's got to understand that. I was considered a mama's boy. That's right. And you had great legs too. Red, yeah. <laughs> and I had a lot of fear growing up, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. There can be a number of reasons to go over. And South End was designed where, if you really knew the people in South End, they all like to act like bad whatever you want to call it but they really won't that was just the nature of the of the beast most i would tell you that the majority of the people that i knew and met over the years growing up all who i i would have told you when i was 12 years old they were all going to be in jail and i will tell you right now like me some of them were in their own business some of them became firemen some of them became uh, EMS drivers, um, teachers, teachers. That would be me. You would. It, when I was growing up, you would have thought South End. These people don't have a chance because mm -hmm. it was a poor neighborhood. But they had good parents mm -hmm. with morals, mm -hmm. and they knew what it was like to have to grow up in a neighborhood that was tough, for the sake of saying tough. Uh, because most of the kids that thought they were tough weren't so tough. And when you grow up, you realize, you know, it's life. Now, Summer Street is part of the South End, but in their eyes it's not, because right. you had to go down the hill to be in the South End. Right. And interestingly enough, again, which I feel really sad about, and I was saying that earlier, I, I wish today we would knew today what we didn't know then as kids, Part of our goal was to leave the South End, and it's so sad because the culture, the history that's there is now lost because what happened is when the memes passed away and left their houses, or when the moms and dads mm -hmm. passed away and left their houses, the kids weren't going back. They had left. When well, I bought my first so, house that I bought was on Ann Street. Yeah. Here's but Summer that's Street. Not the South End. Here's Summer Street. <laughs> Go up here. There was Ann Street. It was yeah. a back street. Yeah. I didn't live on South End anymore. Yeah. I lived on Ann Street. And we were made to feel like we had made it if we left the South End, which That's is right. so sad because right. really, oh. yeah, that was sad. Because to, when you think about it, for me anyway, all those homes that are gone now, as far as being in the original families, they end up being apartments, they end up being sold again and again, they end up being deteriorated, and that's really kind of too bad because and, but I had to. I also had to get over the fact that when I first moved back home, the French community was going away, and so now for me, and I go quite often because that's where I do my volunteer work. The uh, they're the ghosts that follow me, and so I sometimes try to listen and hear the the voices of of the people that I grew up with. And that was the other thing. If we joined something coming from the South End, you had to know you better be good because you had all of those other communities in the city where kids got things for their, their parents paid for everything and nothing wrong with that and I'm sure our parents Your would have done the same. Your last name was as important as where you lived. Yeah, yeah. When I went to high school, my last name was <clears throat> Mud. Mark. Right. My last mm -hmm. name was Mud. But as a rule, 
We were taught to be submissive and obedient. Right. And we were told, and I believe there was even a sign on the stairwell that you come up. <clears throat> we were told that poverty was a blessing from God. That's right. And we would get our reward in heaven. Poverty is not a blessing from God. No. <laughs> and today I'm like, that just is bullshit. Poverty is not a blessing from God. No. But, and, and you get that drummed into you and you stop believing it. And so a lot of us didn't make the effort that, again, who we could have been compared to what we are, who knows, right? And the seven of us. You, you say that, but at the same time, we all came out of it. Pretty I damn say good. pretty damn good, absolutely. Damn well, good. that's my point, is that all of us became professionals. <coughs> Look at Fred, four-year graduate. Mm -hmm. We're, we're four, right. first year, uh, first generation college students. My brother right. Ron, myself, and Fred. And then you became an entrepreneur, a businessman, a yeah, successful I mean, I went one. Yeah, I went to my mother. My father had passed away at that point. I think I was in my late 20s. When Dad passed away? I was in my 20s when he passed away, but anyway. Mm -hmm. And I had started a little business in my garage selling secondhand furniture. And I'd made signs for myself and had cards made. And I brought one to my mother and she looked at that and she pinned it up on the thing and said, that's really nice, Todd. She said, but you know, I want you to understand something. You probably won't get very far with that. See, internal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, really? I like it. She said, oh yeah, you can like it. You love it. You're doing a good job with it. But don't have a lot of expectations. Yeah. And she wasn't saying it because she was being mean. She was saying it because she believed that her mother's boy son, who grew up poor, didn't have what it took mm -hmm. to run a business and didn't want to disappoint himself. Mm -hmm. So she was doing it out of love. Because yeah. my wife was not raised that way. So when we got home, she said, you can do this. I, I know, yeah, but you know, maybe we'll just, no, you can do it. So we kept doing it. I wish my mother would have lived long enough for me when I opened up my business. She didn't, but I know she's there. Um, mm. Because the biggest reason I opened up my business was to prove to myself I could do it. Not for any other reason. Mm. All right, there was a very serious stigma yeah. for the South, and it still and, is and, there today. And it is, it's still there yeah. today. I've been the last couple, three years <laughs> driving students. I'm a, drive, I'm a driving instructor. But even now, when I, because uh, I bring them down my area all the time. I say, this is my, where I used to live, and I show them different places. And they say, well, it's a rough neighborhood. I say, yeah, it was rough when I was growing up. So it still has that stigma to it. Mm -hmm. So if you come from here, You can apply for the training job that I'm going to apply for, but if I live on King Street and you live on um, Elm Street or Bowtile Avenue, you're going to get the job because you live over here and I live over here. So that stigma is, and it's still there today. Yeah. So my mother always wanted to make sure that don't get your hopes too, too high. <clears throat> yeah. One of the things that happens in the culture that we grew up in, and for the most part, Rhea also had a very different upbringing. She was encouraged. We weren't encouraged to better ourselves. We were, if we made it through high school, that was the limitation, that was perfectly fine. And they really wanted us to finish school, high school. Yeah. I wanted to go on to college. And when I would come in and talk about it, my mom would say, well, do you think you're better than anybody else? Why would you do that? You know, and who, what are you trying to prove? Or who do you think you are? And those <coughs> phrases, and we loved our mother. And so I didn't want to disappoint her. And I thought, well, maybe she must be right. So I suppose I shouldn't do that. Um, but but yeah. I was supported at school and not supported at home. Right. And yet, I have a picture of me with my two medals <coughs> that my mom had made up for me. That was a photo from the Sentinel. And it was just somewhere. And I had it. Never looked at the back. Never looked at the back. I brought it to the Photoshop here on Main Street and said, would you put it in a frame for me? Because I, it, I was getting ready to go to college and I needed something that would tell me I could do it. And that the picture with the medals were going to help me to get through that. He gave it to me a few weeks later. He's since passed away. They <coughs> took on the uh, Photoshop oh, yeah? on Main Street. And he said, I left the back open. He said, I didn't know if you wanted to see that or not. And I said, I don't know what's in it, on it. And it said, I hope my daughter knows how much I 
I'm proud of her for what she's accomplished. Mom would never say that to us. No, not to your face. No. And of course, that meant everything to me. So you never saw the picture. That wasn't important to me anymore. It was what mom had said. And so I always put that up there knowing I could do it. When I was in school, <laughs> I showed my daughter, she's 42. I showed my daughter a couple years ago, my high school junior grades. And she went, oh my God. Because if I wasn't flunking, there was even an F minus. I don't know if that's even possible, but I had an F minus. <laughs> So I was basically flunking everything. But again, it was, that you know, was Anna, that was me. I was sort of hiding. And I flunked general math, which general math is twos and fours, and plus and plus and nine, you know, that, that's it. Forget algebra or anything like that. And I, I actually flunked that. So I ended up leaving school. That's when we got married early. My wife was a senior, I got married. At 18, went to night school, got my EGG, uh, whatever you call that. Mm -hmm. And always wanted to have my own business, which I've already said. And there's no possible way anybody, if I was in that bad of a shape growing up, would be expected to be able to run their own business. And when I ran my own business, even now, I can do numbers in my head that I could never do before. They just, it's, it's, it's all automatic. So, a lot of it had to do with here. And when you live in a poor neighborhood, it's very easy to go there. And we were a poor family. And everybody in the South End, majority of them were in a poor family, or at least it seemed that way to me. Um, the reality was some people worked at the mill. Some people worked at, in different places like that, hospitals, whatever. That was my look at it. Um, Where did you get that perception, Todd? Where do you feel I that got paper? that perception from seeing... Where did that begin? That began... I'm Chief Executive Officer of KBCAT, um, and the Kennebec, it actually stands for the Kennebec Valley Community Action Program, and we're one of about 1,100 across the country of community action agencies. We've been in place since 1965. Um, there are 10 community action agencies in Maine, um, and KBCAT serves Kennebec County and Somerset Counties. And our mission is basically to eliminate poverty or reduce um, the barriers that are keeping people in poverty and from achieving financial stability in their household. Yeah, I, I mean, there was a day, I, it, I wasn't here, um, but, I, but I've heard a lot of stories about um, the close-knitness of the, the neighborhood down here. Uh, the businesses that were here. I mean, where our transportation building is located, that used to be a gas station. Um, it was a very strong um, French heritage down here as well. And there was a hockey rink. I mean, it, it was just a lot of um, positive activities and it was more economically probably stable. Um, I, I don't know what made that shift, um, 
but businesses folded. Um, there's very few down here now, actually. Very similar to a lot of um, small towns that are built along rivers that were really very focused on manufacturing. For many, and it's it's as the manufacturing left a lot of these towns, along with it went the you know economic opportunity for folks. Um, you know we had the Hathaway factory that was booming. There were there were many factories right along actually the the river um, back in the like 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, down where the head of falls is right now. Um, there were, and then there was Scott Paper across the way. Oh yeah, people had really good jobs working at Scott Paper. And those retail jobs, of course, they, they did not replace the kind of income that the mill jobs did. You know, it wasn't a, oh, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm gonna go do that and make the same money. Right. And many of the mill jobs, the people who had those positions, they had done them all their lives. They, there was no other job for them to do at that point, for many of them at that time in their lives. So a lot of them retired um, or didn't really go back to work in, in a, yeah, the same sort of high paying position uh, because they didn't have the skills nor did they have the ability to go back to school to get those, a different set of skills. And unfortunately, the, uh, I don't know if any of the Senate members talk to you folks about this, but. Um, the housing prices in the South End have grown, it, it, it's unbelievable. Two years ago, you could have probably purchased homes down here from forty to $80,000. Homes are now going for you know, 120, 150, $200,000 in the South End. And there's a fear that it's gonna push people of lower income out of the neighborhood because they're not going to be able to afford it or as um, apartment buildings get purchased by investors or you know large companies and rehabbed and then rented out for a much higher amounts again lower income people are not going to be able to afford those rents so the best things the city of waterville ever did was to have um, a forum about the South End, and it was in 2001. Yeah, 2001. Yeah. So they gathered it because they were hearing so many complaints from, from residents and neighborhood uh, residents about the condition of the South End. I think they felt like they were being forgotten. So the city held a series of forums, and we were there. Uh, it, I mean, it, the Muskie Center was filled with um, uh, neighborhood people from the neighborhood. And that was the catalyst for all these things that you're seeing now. Um, the cleanup day, uh, the bike swap day, the South End Teen Center. Um, we had um, a community police officer for a long time, and that was a huge mm -hmm. um, benefit to the neighborhood. We saw crime go down. Uh, teens felt really connected with this police officer. In fact, it's Bill Bonney, who um, is the assistant chief of Waterville PD um, because he was the community police officer down here for a very long time. He'd go to door to door, knocking on people's doors just to chat with them and play basketball with the teens at the teen center. And so it was just a really positive um, environment and connection for teens with police officers. You know, they typically hadn't had that sort of perception that law enforcement is your friend. <laughs> But that changed, and a lot of things changed at that time period, and it's really has been good. I'm Bill Bonney. I'm the Deputy Chief of Police here at the Waterville Police Department. Uh, I've been here for a little over 24 years now, and um, over the course of my career, I've done a variety of different things, um, but I was the South End uh, Neighborhood Enhanced Policing Officer, is what the position was called, from 2003 to 2005. So, uh, you know, that gave me a lot of unique opportunities and, you know, a lot of opportunity to learn and understand, um, you know, why some of the folks that we were dealing with on a professional level um, were acting the way they were, they were acting because I was seeing um, you know, how people were being raised in some of these circumstances and how we could possibly intervene in a positive way. 
The South End is such a unique place because, like I said, it's rich with history. You know, you've got the Hathaway Shirt Factory down there that now, of course, that's um, been remodeled to apartments. Um, and, you know, there was a very large French population down there. And like I said, that was still um, existent when I started here 24 years ago. Um, you know, they used to have, um, there was a, there was a police officer who I never met named Captain Rancourt and he ran an ice skating rink and, you know, so it was this kind of very unique little community unto itself. And then, you know, over the years it changed and we get that more transient population. And so when people don't have buy-in in their community, that's when you start having problems. And so that's why the Neighborhood Association is great because it's people that are buying into their community that's trying to make it a, a better place to be. Um, you know, we have a um, very large uh, French culture here, uh, particularly in the South End. When I, when I came to Waterville 24 years ago, a lot of those houses on, on Water Street that are now multifamily apartments were were single family homes and and the folks that lived there were born there and had lived there their whole lives and some of them still spoke french and so um it's just you know fascinating how the community has evolved over the years i think people from the south end were were treated differently and you know it was known that they didn't have too much and and even even well-intended people i think um you know would single out you know the kids from from the south end i do i do think that was real you know right before i went into the position um as a community policing officer down there um they really had pushed for that they said listen we need a police officer they felt like they weren't getting the same services from the police department as you know other parts of the city and they said you know we need our own police officer to focus on these goals and you know they worked hard to get that and they got it when I got assigned down there, my primary functions were improve the quality of life for the residents of the South End and to improve the image of the uniformed law enforcement officer to those residents. And so I knew I was going to work closely with the teen center um, because the residents had identified juvenile crime as a huge problem. And so I knew I, the way that I was going to attack that was going to be um, working together with the youth in the community. And so I remember the first time I walked into the teen center in uniform and they looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we got some work to do here. Um, but then, you know, as time went on, I, I really wanted to be somebody that they could trust, somebody that they could go to if they had a problem. Everybody had my cell phone number and it wasn't my work cell phone it was my personal cell phone i put it right on my business cards and so everybody had that and they felt free to use it i, I get calls at one o'clock in the morning but that was i felt that was the position you know to be there and be available and you know after a while i became um a fixture at the teen center um and we made some you know very important progress with the youth in the community um and you know, I, I used to participate in field trips with the teen center, and I would park my truck in the parking lot of the teen center, and everybody in the south end knew what my personal truck looked like. And I felt like my truck was safer in the south end than it was in the police department parking lot because, you know, they knew it was mine, they knew I was there, they knew I was doing positive things to help people, and, and they appreciated that. And so probably, you know, you say you, we do a thankless job, but that was probably the most appreciated I had ever felt, you know, in my 25 years doing the job was when I was working down there. So it was nice. Yeah, Char you know, Charlie's a, Charlie's a good guy. He was very active in the neighborhood association when I was down there. Um, and, you know, this is a man that has a lot of buy-in into his community because he's been there his whole life right and he's worked in the past on on the trails along the Kennebec River and you know really this is a guy that's tried to make it a better place to live and has yeah. consistently done that and so he sees you know some of these problems coming in and 
you know, absentee landlords um, and transient populations. They come in, they don't have any buy-in into the community. Um, they don't care about their property. And, you know, for a guy like Charlie that's done nothing but work to make the community a better place, that's pretty frustrating. Mm -hmm. How's it, it must have changed a lot. Oh yeah, a lot has changed. Everybody knew everybody, you know what I mean, yeah. by name. And uh, we used to visit everybody. And today, we don't even know your neighbors now. I mean, that's, yeah. And uh, half of them don't even come out of the house. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I don't know. It's, it's, it's all changed, you know. The old days was everybody helped each other. And uh, and uh, like I said, they used to, you know, take a walk, you know, after supper. And, you know, geez. Well, like I said, today you don't know no, the neighbors. And you don't see too many people out. You know what I mean? Uh, either playing that radio, that, well, I call them the radio, but it ain't. It's that little thing they got in their hands there. Yeah. It's the people that, that comes in now. I, I blame the city of Waterville, because, you know what I mean? These people, when they come in here, live here a month, two months, you don't know who they are. First thing you know, this, you know that they're gone, then somebody else moves in. Yeah. And that's why I got that fence. So there's not even enough time for to like get to know people that move in. No, you don't. Come and move you don't have time. No, yeah. that's why my son used to live, not where that car is, but the next driveway over. And I told him, get out of get out of Waterville. I told him to go to Oakland. They, they had four acres there. They built a house. I says over here, you don't know who you got for a neighbor. Do you think uh, Waterville is on an upward trend or downward? They think it's they think it's upward. I think it's downward. You know. But me, Depends I, how you I, look at it, right? I, I like to look at it, uh, you know, uh, oh, geez, ahead, you know, ahead of time, you know. But not these guys, they, they got like, but like I said, you don't know who's, who's your neighbor. Uh, the reason is they took a thousand dollars worth of stuff. Oh. The, uh, but never caught them. See your mind I got? Oh yeah. There and over there. No, they come in here and take every, everything. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. But what are you gonna do? Yeah. Now I'm too old now, you can't you gotta stay here. Yeah. Wow. But the chief says you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Where do you guys see Waterloo going in the future? I think only upward. <laughs> I really do. Um, and I see a lot of uh, great things happening in Waterville. People are motivated here to, to make it happen. Woohoo! Yeah, baby! <laughs> so they're doing a video about the South End. So they wanted to get some of the... Oh boy. Well, um... Uh, <laughs> We got river, we got lakes, <laughs> we got skate park. It's not really a skate park. A anymore. skate park. Where's the skate park? Southern. Why? Really. We have By a skate way, park that isn't really a really skate, skate park. It's just a block of concrete. Hi, <laughs> what? You only have a river. There's no lake. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, actually, no. There is like it's a couple. It's a Kennebec River, not a Kennebec lake. lake. Kennebec Lake can be arranged. We have lakes near here, but the main body of water is a river. I don't know where to start. <laughs> well, the teen center is a really good place to go. Me, me and a bunch of buddies when I was in high school would come here and just play basketball a lot. Um, it's really where it started. Maybe. I don't know. What do you mean, maybe? I don't know. You guys got everything. You put any milk in that chocolate milk? Yeah, he's baking chocolate milk. That's like an inch of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> it's a proper ratio. How'd it go again? I'm a funny camera. Was it bad? Um, I 
I, before I was here, I worked at a church actually in Augusta and I wanted to just start being out in the community. So I actually started volunteering at the Augusta Teen Center. Um, and then I was like, oh, I kind of love this. It's like this little pocket of, you know, kids who need a place to go, who need a positive influence in their lives. And so um, when I felt like it was time for a change, I started looking and um, found this place and they were hiring and I was like, cool, perfect. So I actually moved to Fairfield. Um, and so, yeah, been here for a year and it's a special place. <laughs> You never know what's gonna happen. You never know who's gonna show up, who's gonna just bust in the front door. And it's, it really is kind of like a family, you know? You know, a lot of these kids, they're awesome. They're so sweet, they're so smart. They have so many talents. Um, they have a lot of obstacles to overcome. And so, you know, they come and they have people who are supportive and um, we get to be really connected to their families as well. And just a, a really safe, known place in the neighborhood that a lot of people are aware of. All the people that live around here, they're always keeping an eye out for the building, making sure everything's good and um, connecting us. And I think the whole community really stays pretty tied together. Um, from what I've learned in the past year, everybody's always looking out for each other, trying to help each other. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty special place. Yeah, when I was trying to decide if I was going to take the job, I walked down to the trails and then I just sort of took a walk through the neighborhood. And I was just looking around and I was like, there's a lot of there's a lot of like hidden places of beauty that I think people might not know or wouldn't look for until you stop and slow down to like walk through. There's so much history, there's so many unique things, um, so I really like it. We're helping to alleviate poverty in the area and so that's a, a big thing that a lot of the families um, face and so um, most of our kids we're working with them to find resources um, and helping their families as well to connect with other resources that would help them. You know I think um, I think one of the hardest parts is you can we can help to a certain extent and that's that's like everything in life you know each person has their own decisions to make and you know at the end of the day they go back back home and um, so we try to help them to the best of our ability but you know sometimes there are, there are nights where you're up thinking about a kid and hoping they're doing doing well or you know you hear about what happened during their day or what was on their mind and um, you know just always hoping the best for them I guess and so I think that's sometimes the hard part is just knowing what they're going through or the challenges they might be facing individually and um, hoping everything works out well. Yeah, and we try to we try to stay connected with them as well, like after they graduate. So like Nate, the, there he is, there's Nate. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of former teens that will stop back in and visit um, and just, it's cool to hear where they're going and the updates on life. And um, we welcome some of them to volunteer as well because um, a lot of them, say that it's a, a place that had a big impact on their lives and they might not see it in the moment, but I think when they look back later in life, they're like, okay, those are people who cared about me, who believed in me, who really helped me a lot. That's what we're trying to do. What was it like growing up in Waterville? Uh, it's not bad. Uh, sports were definitely, you know, a must, uh, just to keep yourself uh, sane, I guess. You meet some people that just didn't have their way in life, you know, they didn't really grow up with great parents. They kind of went down the wrong road, you know, grew up with this attitude like, I rule the world, you know, you don't mean anything, but it just, in the moment it sucks, but you meet some guys, and, you know, after I graduated, you don't really talk to them, uh, a lot of people. I talked to one of my buddies that were just inseparable, um, but, the one part I miss about high school is just you go to school and you have all those people to talk to, but you graduate and you really got to just start over. That's one of the things that sucks, but like I said, it's just some of the people, the attitudes are, it's just, that's not who they are and you can tell they could be something else, but that's just what they, that's just what they want to do. What are some of the struggles that people face around here? Around this neighborhood? Yeah. I'd have to say just the way people were raised. People really didn't have, you know, good parenting skills, you know, just they weren't raised in a good home. My dad's, you know, was a mill worker for a long time. Um, smart guy, you know, he's not an idiot. Mom went to college, got a bachelor's degree, you know, human services is what she did. Uh, they taught me to just be nice to everyone, you know, be myself, doesn't matter what people think. 
other people didn't grow up with that. They grew up with, you know, drugs in the home. They grew up with parents who didn't care, lived off, you know, whatever they, whatever they make, however they make it. To me, that doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I was raised differently. I started working when I was 14. I went to school and I got a worker's permit. Got my brother to sign me off and he actually hired me for my first job. I stayed, I worked at Domino's. He was a hiring manager up in uh, Wyndham. And then I transferred to Waterville when uh, school was starting up. And I've been working there for three, four years. Um, I left there to go to college for a little bit to pursue firefighting. I uh, came back and I work over at Orion Cordage in Winslow. It's a rope company, it's a rope mill. And I, uh, I've i been volunteering for the Waterville Fire Department for almost a year now. So I may have not, you know, grown up in, you know, New York or Massachusetts or, you know, Florida, but I've traveled, you know, visit grandparents and everything like Alabama, Florida, Utah, stuff like that. Um, Waterville as a town, you know, may not be all woodsy and, you know, but it's definitely a slower pace up here. Like you can travel to Mass, Boston, you know, it gets a little hectic depending on where you are. Sometimes it, you know, slows down. But up here, it's just people do their own thing. And they try and stay out of everyone's way, you know, once in a while. And it's uh, pretty slow. You have all these surrounding towns that have a lot of woods to them. Like you got Vassboro, Fairfield, Oakland. You've got all these great surrounding towns, local businesses. You know, people just trying to make a living for themselves. There was a couple of my buddies who didn't really have a lot growing up. Uh, one was actually, one of my buddies was actually taken into a foster family and he's learning how to drive, get his driver's license. He's learning how, you know, take action on the road. Um, we all thought he was gonna drop out, just, you know, do whatever, you know, live life how he wanted to, not listening to the rules. Um, and this was coming from a kid who threatened to drop out junior year, but we talked to him, we knocked some sense into him. He stayed, graduated high school with honors senior year. Uh, we helped him out a lot and he got his first job over at AutoZone and he's been, you know, putting in the work. He might not like it, but we're just glad he didn't drop out, you know. Uh, I volunteer for the uh, fire department for a while ago, so definitely has my heart. I definitely don't want to go anywhere. Maine might not be the greatest state, you know, politics or, you know, whatever, but Waterville is my hometown and that's what I'm gonna, I'm here to serve it, so that's what I want to keep doing. To me, the only, the, the, bigger cha the biggest change is the, the people who come and go. That really is what makes or break a community, I think. If you have people that stay 10, 15, 20 years, raise their family there, then it changes the flavor. It cha you know, people take care of their properties better, people take care of their parks better, uh, they take care of their neighborhoods better. Uh, you know, the children are uh, more in tune to what's going on. Uh, neighbors know neighbors again. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, say, I think, and again, it's no fault of the, the, those who come and go. It's just the nature of the beast, you know, what's happening and how property has been bought up for the purpose of renting. And so people tend to come and go. When I was growing up, everybody uh, pretty much owned their own homes. Uh, those that didn't were renters. Usually the owner was there. The owner might be on the first floor with their family and then the renter would be on the second floor. Uh, so they still were here. And it, it, the dynamics of their yards were cleaned, the roads were cleaned. Uh, it, it just, and you had two parent families for the most part in those days. And it didn't matter what was going on. People just stayed together and very supportive of one another, very helpful of one another. One of the, how can I put that, uh, expectations or desires maybe from our parents was that we would move out of the South End. And if we had, then for some reason, they probably felt like we had made it. We, we, we'd either gone to college or got good jobs. And so we were successful because we were able to get out of the South End. Uh, the South End carries a lot of uh, stigma, unfortunately, uh, and I, till this day I still don't see it, I, but I, I can appreciate that most of us did move out and we left behind the houses and we sold them and we sold to, over the, over the years, people who uh, became uh, buying properties to rent and making a business out of it. And so now we have a lot of transient uh, neighbors and nothing wrong with coming and going uh, but it, it doesn't there's no stability in that 
for a neighborhood. Uh, people just took care of each other. And, and really, when you move about, even today, you can see that happening in different places, in different, on different streets. So that, that feeling is still there. It's just not as strong as it was uh, when I was growing up, but it's still there. It began when we moved to the South End and I first started hanging around with people at. So it was internal? It uh, came from the South End itself, you think? It, it, I, I don't know what you've told him. Nothing. Oh, God. Okay. My father was an alcoholic. That's where it started. He was a really, really, because you don't know this as a child. He was a man with a heart of gold. His heart was so big, big he could not deal with reality, is the only way I can express it. Yeah. And he never had a chance. Mm -hmm. From the age, his age 12 on, he never had a chance. He, he really gave it all he had. Yeah. And you can't deny the man what he did, but he went to the bottle because he never thought it was good enough. Well, that's where that started. And then when we moved to South End and we were poor, I started hanging around with people that I thought were badasses, for the sake of using that word. And there was this ace guy, <laughs> guy that was really uh, pretty nasty dude, really. Um, died very young. He died at 40 years old of an overdose. Mm -hmm. um, that actually even Ace himself, this is what people don't look at. When you're on the outside looking in, Kobe, when they're on the outside looking in, if you were to see Ace, if he was here today, you'd go, oh my God. But if you really knew the guy, he was a good guy. It was just what he went through himself and the things that happened to him over the years that made him who he was. And he's just protecting himself more than anything else, just like my father did. Um, but that's where that came from. So I always felt that fear, and it never went away. Mm. Um, and I got married. Uh, it stayed with me for years. Uh, never thought I could do a heck of a law. Mm -hmm. Did sales jobs, whatever, that type of thing, until I realized that I actually could do something. And said, you know, the worst scenario is if I can't do it, I can't do it. I'll never know until I try, which is why I went to my own business. And, and you did it with a vengeance. I you did it with a vengeance. And, and for 21 years, I mm -hmm. did everything. It, if you don't know where I come from, mm -hmm. you don't know what it took for me to go where I had to go. I'll say it because I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I don't mind saying it. I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. I've been sober 38 years. So I understand that part of it. Some people never get out of it, and it's not their fault. It is a disease, like they say, it's a real disease. The problem is, is it's, a, it's an imaginary line, okay? And what people don't realize is once you cross that line, going back the other way, it's very hard to do. And that's where the problem comes in. You can be a wealthy person, and parents can have all the money in the world. If you get into the drugs enough where you cross that imaginary line, it's very hard to come back, it's very hard. I came back for my family which is what dad did, same thing. He came back for his family, which is what a lot of these men did. Their family was the most important thing in their lives. It was. Most important thing in their lives. Raising their kid, no matter how much they drank, for the sake of saying that, raising their son to be a man was important. Was that was a big deal. But there's a lot of good things that happen to people with all the fun that they had. They drank like, shh, like crazy, mm -hmm. but they had a good time. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you went to my house <laughs> on 8 Pine Street, let alone King Street, and they were playing scat, you walk in and it's just smoke. One white big cloud yeah. with the beer all around and they have a hell of a good time. Yeah. Because that's the way they did things. For nickels. For nickels. And it was fun. Uh, so stuff like that I remember. It's just, I think, I like to bring up what I felt and what I went through because I think that's important that people know that because that was part of what South End was about. Mm -hmm. For the guy like me that didn't have a clue <laughs> and thought that everything was going to be bad all the time, it, that's not the way it worked. 
You know, the, these people were just hardworking people. Some drank more than they should have. Uh, some did things they probably shouldn't have done. But they were good people. They were solid. Mm -hmm. And like Paula said, I can't think of anybody that wouldn't have your back if you need them. So my older brother or me or somebody else younger than me that grew up in South End and might have had some bad experiences here with them, some good ones over here. At the beginning, like I had said, the bottom line being is 98.9% .9 of the people I thought were bad were all doing a hell of a job with their lives. Mm. So it was more what I f internalized myself as a person because of what I saw. I'm grateful today that I went through those things Mama, yeah. because <laughs> it's easier for me when you're watching the news or you're watching this, you're watching that, and you might hear somebody, even a friend or a family that'll say, I can't believe they did that. Well, kind of look where they live at. Until they walk into their shoes. Not that it was right or wrong, but until you walk into their shoes, don't take for granted the guy that's sitting there that's got his can out like this and wants a quarter. There's a reason why he's sitting there. And that's not the way he was raised. I dare say 95% of any child, including myself, that came from this area, all grew up good, one way or the other. Because you st I still, I always opened up the door for my mother and father, my mother. I always said please and thank you. I always had morals. I always knew what was right or wrong, even though I was getting myself in trouble because I was in a low neighborhood, so to speak. Is that everybody went to, went to, everybody went to church on Sunday. Everybody. Yeah. No matter what Went was going to, on, No, right? that's yeah. just the way it was. You could, you could know that Hojo over here was an alcoholic and caused trouble all week long and had the cops come over three times, but you're going to find him in church Sunday. with it, Sunday with his wife and his kids, no matter what. And that's what kind of kept it so that it never exploded, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. It was a lifestyle. You still film it? Except that I just love being here, that the potential is, um, is there for people to move in, to be able to make a home for their children, uh, to invest in a neighborhood that has uh, the history that it has. And it takes just one family at a time to do that. And so someone has to have the courage to uh, punch out of the norm. You know, to leave the first rangeway, to leave Mayflower Hill, to leave, you know, those, uh, and create one here and be that first person to do it. Whether it's a family from Kobe or a family from Thomas, you know, I hear so many times, oh, it's a quaint little place, it's so cute, I love it there, but nobody ever buys. <laughs> and I always say that to them, you know. <laughs> I'll say, buy a house here, you know, oh, we're, we're pretty well settled. <laughs> You know, and that's fine. I mean, again, we gravitate to our own, right? And that just, that makes sense. You know, I'm sort of an oddball. <laughs> we were on the pond, you know, and my husband's like, okay, who leaves the pond, Paula? Really? <laughs> you know, I'm happy here. <laughs> so.
time you die You can have everything you like Infinite time inside your mind Yeah, when I first, well, when I first started to work, where Bala, uh, the kids used to